All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, again, I'm Rob Vischer. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of St. Thomas Law School. And we are very honored that you've taken the time tonight to come and learn more about our work in restorative justice. When the law school was opened 20 years ago, the most common question that was asked was, why the heck do we need another law school? And we had lots of good answers about what we foresee, what we foresaw in the future. I wish that 20 years ago, when everybody was asking that question, we could have fast forwarded to this night so they could understand why the world needed another law school. When you combine legal expertise with care for the whole person, with a deep commitment to empathy, and with a recognition of the transformative power of human connection, you start to have an understanding of the potential for restorative justice to heal relationships and heighten the quality of justice and restoration that can be accomplished. So I couldn't be prouder of the work that's already happening in this space that the law school has embarked on, and I couldn't be more excited for what is to come in the future. So I'm not an expert in this, so you don't need to hear from me anymore. I'm gonna turn it over to our inaugural director of the Initiatives on, Re Initiative on Restorative Justice and Healing, Father Dan Griffith, who's the Wenger Family Faculty Fellow at uh, the law school and has already uh, touched so many lives through his commitment to this work. So please uh, join me in welcoming Father Dan Griffith. Thank you, Thank you uh, everyone, and really, really heartened by your, by your presence, uh, the number of folks who came, uh, tonight uh, certainly uh, surpassed our expectations. Uh, thank you to Dean uh, Rob Vischer for his warm welcome and strong support of the Initiative on Restorative Justice and Healing. Uh, as his colleagues know, uh, Dean Vischer is a terrific leader who models well the values that the initiative seeks to foster. Justice, inclusive dialogue, humility, and an abiding commitment to solidarity. Thank you also to Dr. Julie Sullivan for her support of restorative justice and this initiative at the University of St. Thomas. And on behalf of our leadership team, Julie Craven, Amy Levod, and Hank Shea, we all uh, extend our welcome as well to all of you here today and those who are joining us uh, via live stream, including members of our advisory board in, in Boston and, and Washington, D.C. Really thank you again for your presence today. Uh, we're heartened by colleagues, uh, folks who work in this area, victim survivors who are here, uh, colleagues at the St. Thomas School of Law. Uh, this is really indeed uh, a time of celebration and possibility, but also acknowledging where harm has occurred. Before introducing Janine Geske, Justice Janine Geske, I wanted to take a few minutes to share with you the vision for this new initiative and to offer some words of gratitude. The Initiative on Restorative Justice and Healing has a threefold focus to name and help heal harm that occurs from leadership and institutional failures, racial injustice, and polarization. Let's not soft pedal it. Harm abounds in our society. The Archdiocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis and the Twin Cities represent two ground zero locations regarding ecclesial harm and the harm from racial injustice. Victim survivors of clergy abuse and people of color have suffered injustice and attendant harm in our community. Uh, the first event that we will host, which will co-host uh, with the new initiative, Racial Justice Initiative, uh, that is led by Dr. Yohuru Williams, will focus on the intersection of restorative justice and racial justice. 
In the midst of acute harm, people of faith are not without hope. The God in whom we believe is a God of restoration and healing, who calls us as followers to be instruments of justice and healing. The work of restorative justice when rooted in Catholic teaching and biblical faith is pure gospel. It carries on the work of Jesus who goes out to raise up and heal those who are bowed down and wounded. Those who have experienced deep healing through restorative practices are real-time images of resurrection. Restorative justice and restorative practices carry tremendous potential to foster accountability and healing in response to harm in contemporary society. Rooted in the indigenous practices of First Nation peoples of North America and New Zealand, restorative justice is a natural and humane way to respond to harm by inviting various stakeholders in the community to enter into the wound as they enter a circle. As the restorative justice practitioners in this room will tell you, restorative justice has become a worldwide movement because it consistently is effective in responding to harm. We are honored by the restorative justice practitioners and lovers of justice who are here this evening. My journey into restorative justice began six years ago when my friend and colleague Hank Shea introduced me to Justice Janine Geske over dinner. I sat spellbound as Janine, who is a very gifted storyteller, told stories about her call into restorative justice and the powerful experiences of healing that have occurred through restorative encounters of which she was a part. The seeds of my own vocational call were firmly planted that evening. Hank was an early proponent of the use of restorative justice in response to the criminal charges and civil suit filed against the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis by the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. County Attorney John Choi, a gifted innovator, is to be given much credit for including a restorative justice provision in the 2015 settlement agreement with the Archdiocese. Archbishop Bernard Hebda and Tim O'Malley, who is here this evening, also deserve much credit for going well beyond the restorative justice provision by encouraging and participating in restorative justice programming at multiple parishes in the Archdiocese, among priests, at the St. Paul Seminary, and for creating two new positions that are restorative justice in the archdiocese. But all along the way, the main drivers in this work have been victim survivors. These have been the folks who have spurred the archdiocese on sharing their wisdom and sharing their passion for justice and healing. In the fall of 2019, the St. Thomas Law School hosted a symposium on restorative justice healing and law. The day concluded with a memorable panel facilitated by our late friend Tom Johnson, which brought together Choi and Hebda, among others, and featured closing remarks by Frank Muirs, who is also here this evening, who refer referred to restorative justice as vital and demanded. This evening represents a further step on an organic journey into restorative justice and its potential for needed healing. In serving their clients, lawyers stand at the intersection of harm and justice. A lawyer equipped with the skill of deep listening and compassion can be an instrument of healing in challenging situations. Hank and I have been heartened by the positive, positive embrace of restorative justice by our law students in a new course that we teach at UST Law. We are confident that they will become more effective lawyers because of their experience. One of the things that I'm most excited about with the launch of this new initiative is the great team that has come together. My friend and colleague Julie Craven has also experienced a call into restorative justice work and will serve as associate director of the initiative, bringing with her skills and expertise honed through a successful executive career at Hormel, 
Julie has already proven invaluable to bringing us to this day. We did say you can leave behind the spam, though. <laughs> but it's done well. Our colleague, Dr. Amy Levod, a professor in, theology, in the theology department at St. Thomas, will join Professor Hank Shea as a fellow of the initiative. Amy is a leading scholar in the nexus of restorative justice and theology and a strong supporter of the restorative justice movement locally and nationally. Our friend Janine Geske has generously agreed to chair a terrific and diverse board of advisors whose names are listed on the back of your program and a number of folks on the advisory board are here this evening and you can take a look at that list. I could not be more delighted with the leadership that has emerged to help support the work of IRJH as we launch. Present this evening are our friends Chris Ann Valancourt Murphy and Caitlin Morneau from Catholic Mo Mobilizing Network in Washington, D.C. Cheryl Wilson, who will speak after Janine, is a member of the Catholic Mobilizing Network board. These three talented women are national leaders in advocacy for justice and in promoting restorative practices. We are excited about the prospect of partnering with CMN in joint programming and initiatives. I am grateful that they have joined us today from Kansas and from Washington, D.C. We are also exploring other national and local partnerships to help advance the work of the initiative. Lastly, I have some exciting news to share with you before I introduce Janine. Through the generosity of two couples, Hank and Chris Shea and Julie and Doug Craven, the work of the initiative will be aided by two student fellowships named after justice and healing pioneers, Tom Johnson and Janine Geske. And Mike Hogan, uh, Janine's uh, husband, is here today from Milwaukee. Uh, and I know uh, Kayla and Hunter Johnson joined Victoria Johnson uh, here today, and we warmly welcome all of them. Law students who serve respectively as the Tom Johnson and Justice Janine Geske Student Fellows will receive a twice annual stipend which will help defer their educational costs. These students will serve as ambassadors for the initiative and will assist us with programming, hospitality, research, and writing projects. The legacy of Janine and Tom's great work in the areas of justice and healing will be honored and perdure through the work of these students. Thank you, Hank and Chris and Julie and Doug. I know that Tom is looking down and smiling and Frank uh, Muir's over a lunch earlier this summer said uh, very much what all of us who have come to know Tom know in our bones, that he had a preternatural sense of justice and it didn't end there, he had to talk about injustice. He could not let injustice sit. And so I know he would be looking down and smiling, not because we are honoring him, but because we have a plan. That's what Tom always said, what's your plan? And that plan is to respond to harm with accompaniment and solidarity, rooted in the love of God and his call to act with justice. It is now my uh, pleasure and, and honor uh, to introduce Janine Geske. And I, I also want to uh, say a thank you to, to Mark Umbright, who is here, uh, the founding director uh, of the Center for Restorative Justice and, and uh, Peace Building at the U of M. Uh, Mark has been a wonderful mentor. Uh, and a guiding hand in the work in the archdiocese, and I, I thank him for his presence uh, and his work. Justice Janine Geske, a former Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice and Marquette Law School professor, leads international conversations on restorative justice. She is a pioneer in the field of restorative justice, impacting and inspiring practitioners, lawyers, and participants alike. She is honored for her work 
advocating for and establishing various restorative justice practices, including Marquette University's Restorative Justice Initiative. Since 2017, Geske has facilitated restorative justice training and programs in parish, academic, and community settings. She is highly involved in the community through service, speeches, presentations, and extent, extensive membership in various associations and committees, including the Department of Corrections Victims Advisory Committee. She is, a highly, she is highly decorated with numerous awards and recognitions and has been listed in the Best Lawyers in America annually since 2005 for her work in alternative dispute resolution. But I just want to say a word or two personally before she comes up. Uh, I never turned down an opportunity to work with Janine. Uh, she and Mike have become dear friends. Uh, she is a wonderful woman uh, with extraordinary smarts, uh, great uh, gifts, and a compassionate heart for those who have been wounded. Uh, one quick story, I remember we were in, in May at a Catholic high school in Milwaukee doing a facilitated dialogue that began at 8 o'clock in the morning. And it was about 8.30 that night and I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, where does she get her energy? Uh, I was ready to, to, to wilt at that point. But what was inspiring to both of us was to see the breakthrough that was happening among these parents of different backgrounds uh, and, and different ethnicities, uh, white and black and, and, and all sorts of folks taking part in this healing circle and to see the inroads that were happening. Uh, one of Janine's best gifts is the fact that she is a generous mentor. Uh, she is always available to, to countless numbers of us in this work, uh, and I would not be here uh, had she not uh, helped mentor me. And I thank her for her generosity of spirit and for agreeing to be our uh, inaugural uh, chair of our advisory board and addressing us tonight. So please warmly welcome Justice Janine Geske. Thank you. I used to tell people that I really appreciate the introduction, but if you want to hear the other side, my husband will tell you. <laughs> it's really my pleasure to be here on this very exciting evening, and I want to congratulate the Dean um, and St. Thomas Law School and the entire group, including Dan and Julie and Hank, um, in this coming to this very exciting evening of beginning this initiative that is so important, not only to the law school, but to the city of Minneapolis, St. Paul, the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, to our nation and to our world. Um, as Dan indicated, I'm very passionate, and those of you who've talked to me know I'm very passionate about restorative justice. I, like Dan at the beginning, was pretty cynical about the idea of restorative justice, and I, I often tell people that when I first heard about it, I was a circuit court judge in Milwaukee, I thought it was some left-wing liberal kind of touchy-feely kind of process. I thought, what victim is ever going to want to sit down with an offender? And I really was not interested, but I was fortunate enough that I had one of my many mentors was a, a woman in Green Bay Prison who taught the prisoners there who invited me into a restorative justice program she had going for the prisoners. And I too had this transformational moment. And I've been doing this work now, I think close to 20 years, and there isn't a moment that I'm involved in restorative justice that I do not feel the presence of God in that process. It is a remarkable process of letting people be able to express from their heart what's going on in their lives and to, for them to feel the support of the circle or the facilitation and to be able to see the compassion and empathy that we are all capable of for each other. You know, Dan talked about storytelling, and that's how I usually talk about um, restorative justice. And some of you have heard some of my stories, but... Yeah, I just go, I'm going to touch on a couple of them because I think it's the only way you understand 
why these processes are so important in healing. I've, we have done at Marquette and in the community circles involving law enforcement and gang members returning from prison and uh, community members and survivors of crime and lots of different people. And I have heard police officers talk about holding a child who's been shot in his arms and watching that child die and how he or she, that officer, carries that child with him or her in his heart every time he goes out for a shooting. I have heard people of color in a community talk about being harassed and harmed by police officers who are called to a scene. I have heard people of color living in a neighborhood describe how they can't run down the street because others will think they've just committed a crime. And as people share those stories, we all start understanding that there are different perspectives to what looks like the greatest conflict in the world. And when people open up and share those stories, we begin to connect in our humanity to understand and then to grow. I, um, I particularly have liked, and Mark Umbright and I have done this for a long time, working in victim offender dialogues, working with survivors, particularly of violent crimes, their family members, who want to meet face to face with the person that's caused the harm. I have watched family members of somebody who was killed in a homicide armed robbery listen to the offender's version, see the remorse sometimes 10, 15 years later, and break down in tears themselves, ultimately them ending in a hug. The first victim offender dialogue I had almost 20 years ago was such a homicide. Three weeks ago, that man who committed that homicide was released on parole in Wisconsin. The, the sisters, the two daughters of the victim, called me up and said, Kenny's getting out and we are supportive of it. It is time, he has served enough time, we believe he's remorseful, and we think he ought to have a chance to be with his daughter and spend time. Kenny called me, he's called me twice in the last two weeks, to tell me that he's got his temporary driver's license, he's, he's enrolled in vocational training, and he's so excited, and he talks about that victim offender dialogue being the most important thing he ever did in his life. We have seen survivors of homicide by intoxicated user, where the family understandably is irate over what happened, suddenly see the tears of remorse by the driver and come to a new understanding that there were lots of harm, lots of harm that happened um, on that day and be able to grow, to talk to each other and some of them actually to walk through their pain together. I have one case where that happened and after we were done, the father of the victim who was killed in the drunk driving accident went out and started talking to high schools along with the driver the two of them talking about the harm that can happen. We had mentioned, and I applaud uh, St. Thomas for taking on racial issues. We know how tough these issues are, and they are rooted in a long history of discrimination and racism. And we need to get to a place where people understand. Understand the racism, understand the anger, and understand that only way we get through this is for us to be able to walk it together and, and go through it. Dan talked about working in a high school with some teachers and parents, and one of the, one of the stories out of the story that Dan was talking is we had these parents, and we had some very conservative white fathers in this group who didn't believe there was systemic racism and that they didn't believe it was a serious problem. And there were some mothers in that group who were African-American, had African-American daughters in the school. And one mother described through her tears how her daughter's been called a monkey. And you could have heard a pin drop in that room. And the father said, are you sure that's what was said? And she said, it's happened multiple times. And we could see the melting of hearts that happened in that circle at that moment with a new understanding 
of the, of the, of the harm, and it's a specific harm that's happened to a young woman who attended that high school. One of the stories in one of the um, circles we did with law enforcement, we had a police officer, African-American police officer, who described that two of his brothers have been killed by law enforcement, one in Atlanta and one in Milwaukee. And his father was killed in an armed robbery. And how he has decided to remain a police officer because he wants to change what happens out on the streets. And he said, I have a sense that when I go into a neighborhood as a black man, as a police officer, I can make a difference in that community. It is good for people in that circle who have very different backgrounds to understand that that's what that officer carries with him. But we also hear about the secondary trauma of public defenders and of social, social workers and, and psychologists who carry the stories and the harm that they see every day. And for people who've been incarcerated to describe the abuse that they suffered as children. We all walk out of that room much better people because we have a new understanding of what people have suffered. And that's why restorative justice, whether it's on race, whether it involves institutional harm, whether it deals with the criminal justice system can make such a difference. And St. Thomas is stepping up to the plate and working not only with the community but with the student body. I just want to end by saying, sometimes people said to me, why do you teach restorative justice at the high school, at the law school? It really is a topic for, you know, criminal justice or undergrad work. And I have a quick and ready answer. Because lawyers and St. Thomas lawyers become leaders in the community. They become judges, they become prosecutors, they become head of law firms, they work in corporations, and it is important that they understand the qualities of this journey of restorative practices, that they learn how to listen, to be empathetic, to ask the right questions, and to find a path to healing. And that's exactly what this initiative is going to do. And I am very excited to be part of it. So thank you very much for inviting me today. Now, I'm going to introduce um, my dear friend, Cheryl Wilson. When Father Dan called me and, and asked me about being on the advisory committee, and, and we were talking about people that um, we could invite, and I said, oh, I know somebody you don't know. Cheryl, Cheryl is a superstar. Cheryl has over 15 years of wide-ranging experience as a prominent restorative justice practice, practitioner, trainer, researcher, and educator, influencing communities, correctional settings, and educational institutions. I think I, when I first met Cheryl, in fact, I was running the prison program in Wisconsin, and we were comparing notes of things that were happening in Minnesota. From launching her restorative justice career by developing and facilitating victims, offenders, community, a restorative experience, dialogues in Minnesota correctional facilities, to coordinating supports for testifying witnesses at the Liberian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which happened here in the Twin Cities, Cheryl's work creates, na creates national and international impact. She now serves as the executive director of Kansas Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution at Bethel University and president of the National Association of Community and Restorative Justice, a professional organization for restorative justice practitioners. Her recent writing explores the relationship between the restorative justice movement and racial re reconciliation, including a chapter published in Colorizing Restorative Justice. Most importantly, Cheryl is somebody that I have through the years, when I have a problem, a complex restorative justice program problem, Cheryl is the person to call. She's got great experience. She has great heart. She's very good at what she does. And I'm thrilled that she's here tonight and will share some of her thoughts with you. Thank you.
Oh my goodness, what a tough act to follow, Janine. Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Thank you. Um, it is, um, this is home for me. I was born in Tallahassee, Florida. I am a Southerner, but I came here um, when I was in my 20s. I just married my husband, who took a job at IDS back in the day. I'm telling my age a little bit, because that has gone through several iterations. <laughs> um, for 17 years, Minneapolis was my adopted home, and I miss it all the time. Um, our boys, we have two boys who are now grown. This is where they were born. Um, this is the place where I learned about restorative justice. My restorative justice roots are here. I was in a classroom at the University of Minnesota in 1993 <laughs> in Mark Umbright's class when I heard those words the first time. I am so telling my age. Um, some 28 years later, and the reason why I know this is because I was in that class, I was eight months pregnant with my oldest son that summer, and um, so I tell time, I mark time by his age as far as how long I've been in this. And after that class, the, that was what I knew, that was what I was supposed to do next. I didn't know how I was going to do it, how I was going to get there, but through education and um, training and um, working with Mark, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunities to work at the center um, to, to kind of hone those roots. So here we are 28 years later and launching this initiative on restorative justice and healing in the University of St. Thomas Law School. Um, interesting fact, I used to live downtown back, in, back then when my husband was working downtown. He got his master's degree at University of St. Thomas, so we watched the law school come up and be built. So this is a, definitely a full circle moment. Um, in the past year and a half, so much has happened to level the playing field and make clear what seems to bubble up to be the most important at this time. A global pandemic and a racial reckoning has a way of doing that, right? At the beginning of the sheltering in period in 2020, I remember speaking to a colleague about our work with excitement as she expressed how the words and the work, the work of restorative justice practitioners, um, how, how that would be relevant as we come out of this time. They're going to need us, she told me. And I believe that. How to make meaning of this time is incredibly important. I have found that even the most introverted people are feeling the need to have meaningful dialogue right now. Though many of us may think about restorative justice as a process just to remedy harm, at its core, restorative justice should begin with community building. We all have a human need to feel connected to one another. I've learned that from many of my indigenous elders. elders. Chief Justice Robert Yazzie, someone I'm proud to call my friend, of Navajo Nation says when a person acts out in a community, he acts as if he has no neighbors. What's the remedy when that happens? Just as Yazi would say, you call in the relatives, of course. So when we are in community together, then we are connecting in ways that when harm occurs, we're already in relationship, right? So we don't have to conjure something up or do some process that kind of remedies the moment, but we are already saying that we value each other by being in relationship. We've seen many people acting out of late. Some we agree with, 
those whom we uh, see get into what John Lewis calls good trouble in protesting. Others we may not agree with, like those who stormed on the Capitol on January 6th earlier this year. Whether you agree or disagree with one side or the other, we need more people in the world right now who can work in the middle, in the middle. When Tyler Perry received the Gene Herschel Award for Human Humanitarianism, he talked about the middle as the place where you can meet someone at their humanity. He also said, the middle is where dialogue happens. And that is so true. Hopefully, this initiative will provide future lawyers with tools to work toward the middle and not be so quick to work on one side or the other. Yes, it's always important to choose a side and stand on your convictions, but in doing so, my hope is that it will not be done at the expense of drowning out the voices of the opposing side. One of the first things I did when I arrived here over the weekend was I visited the memorial for George Floyd. It was on Sunday morning. I didn't go to church, but it was church for me to be there that day and to see the people going and paying their respects. It was quiet, it wasn't very populated with folks and I could just be there and be present and think about the soul that was lost. I'm reminded of how important it is to hold space to honor humanity in ways that George Floyd's humanity was not honored. It's an obligation to do no harm if we call ourselves practitioners of restorative justice. We honor humanity when we look at it through what I, what I call a racial equity lens. And thinking about that, we recognize the fact that everybody's walk is not the same based on the melanin in their skin. What I can do, I loved, I appreciate the fact that Janine brought up the fact that there are people who look like me who would walk down the street and there are all kind of presumptions that people might make about them. And there's nothing that they can do about that. I remember the story, I'll talk about my own family, my own ignorance in having conversations with my husband when we lived here in the Twin Cities. He would talk about how he would walk down the street, he's in his business suit leaving work and he would hear people, the, the, the clicking of the door locking in people's cars as he's walking by. And he would talk about that. And I really didn't understand and I dismissed it. I was like, oh no, honey, that's not what you think. Just in my ignorance. But we know, we know better now. It's necessary for this next generation of people who are coming through this law school to understand all of this and more and have a lens that says, I am, I am able to not just understand, but I'm able to empathize. It's necessary because there's a need to build future lawyers that do not con continue to contribute to polarized sides. There's a need to understand how to build communities by being in, being in good relationship with each other. There's a need for attorneys who understand the needs of all parties, whether they've caused harm or been harmed, or whether they're people who are experiencing secondary harm as members of the community. There's a need for the next generation of lawyers to be trauma-informed. The murder of George Floyd should serve as a catalyst to change what is 
what has challenged this city for decades. I'm going to say this, as much as I love this place, Minnesota nice is what killed George Floyd. It's easier to sweep behaviors under the rug and pretend everything is okay instead of deal with the ugliness of what is. What would have happened if someone dealt with Derek Chauvin earlier in his life to help him understand the error of his ways instead of dismissing it? Restorative justice and racial justice occur when we recognize the messy, the difficult, and perhaps the ugly things. And we hold them as sacred, not shameful. Some of the work I have the privilege to do is working with families in capital cases. This means I have to work in the middle between the defense and the prosecution in order to honor the needs of those who have lost loved ones in some of the most tragic ways imaginable. It is in these spaces that I find the most, that I, I've had the most satisfying work. I'm grateful for the many ways that I get to be a part of different communities who do restorative justice work. I'm so grateful for um, this past year being a member, a board member of the Catholic Mobilizing Network and being a part of the different initiatives that we've done over the past year that I've been a part of the organization. I'm grateful for the ways that um, I had the urging of uh, um, someone to write about my experiences as a practitioner. Even when I just said, no, I don't have time, I can't do it, I'm too busy. I'm so grateful for Denise Breton for pushing me to submit something. And I'm able to um, be a part of a colleague, of, a, a, a group of, of colleagues who have produced, I believe, something that is speaking to our community very loudly about the walk of practitioners of color and colorizing restorative justice, voicing our realities. I'm grateful to have written a chapter in that book. Um, and I encourage you, as you are learning about this, to please consider reading that to understand how we show up as people of color doing this work. I'm grateful to have been a part of the, the National Association of Community and Restorative Justice since its inception. Janine and Mark um, working alongside them in the beginnings of that organization. Mark calling me up when I had made a decision at that time. I don't know, Mark, if I've told you this, but it was a low time for me career-wise. And I said, you know what? This, this career isn't loving me back right now. I may have to do something else. And my phone rang, and it was Mark. And he said, how would you like to be a part of an organization we're just starting up? And, you know, it's not a job, but it, it kept me connected to the work. And it bridged me in those times when the job didn't come. But I stayed in the field. I stayed with the work. I, things came to me eventually after that. I'm grateful for that. And I'm so happy that we are still growing and thriving as an organization now. Um, in that, I hope that you will stay with us. I hope that you will not just in, in be involved with this, but know that you're networked with people around the country and the world who do this work. You are part of a big community of people who do this work when you lean in. And um, it is my sincere hope that as you give to this effort with your whatever resources you have, give generously as your resources will impact the next leaders who will hopefully work toward the middle where people can hear, experience, and honor one another's humanity. So grateful 
to have been here. Thank you for having um, me here for this. I look forward to working with you and getting to meet you. Thank you very much. Wow, that's uh, quite a one-two punch. <clears throat> Thank you to both uh, Justice Janine Geske and Cheryl Wilson. And uh, just a couple of themes that I think uh, we all heard is the gratitude that we all have to work in this area, uh, the tremendous potential uh, that restorative justice uh, can bring in responding to harm. Uh, Cheryl's comments about working in the middle, I think, is so important. Uh, part of the Catholic tradition is holding things in dialectic tension. It's a, it's a both and rather than an I, either or reality. And so uh, this work allows us to do that. So I thank both of you for your presence here, for your inspiring uh, words tonight, uh, and, and, your, and your good challenging words as well, uh, and, uh, and also your presence on, on the advisory uh, board. So uh, we will ask uh, at some point in the future uh, all of you to help support us. We're not going to do that uh, this evening, uh, and, and uh, that will be uh, coming. But we're going to have some time for more fellowship. I don't have my, what time is it now? Okay, 10 to 7. So there's a, uh, some more time for fellowship. And, uh, and certainly there are new friends and old friends uh, here in this room. We're so delighted uh, uh, Julie and Hank and Amy, uh, Dean Vischer, uh, we thank you for your strong support of this initiative and for your warm welcome today. And I know you're encouraged, particularly that Janine and Cheryl were talking about the work of forming lawyers and how important uh, that is. That's why we're here. So just a few things before we conclude the formal uh, part. And again, thank you, including our friends in various places that we've worked with in West Virginia and other places who are, we know are Zooming in today. We thank you for your uh, presence. Uh, we're going to keep you informed uh, about upcoming programs, including the October 13th event uh, on the intersection of racial justice and restorative justice. It's 4 to 6 p.m. in the law school atrium. Uh, it will also be available via live stream. Uh, this event, as I said, is co-sponsored with the new Racial Justice Initiative uh, which is directed by Dr. Yohuru Williams of St. Thomas. Uh, plans for a program on the harm of polarization and bright spots of unity uh, are underway for November, so we'll have more information. Uh, Julie will be putting together the IRJH webpage, and there are going to be all sorts of uh, wonderful resources, uh, including you can, uh, you can get your copy of Colorizing Restorative Justice. We assign chapters. In fact, Ricardo, your favorite chapter, he dug right into it, our law student. Uh, and the favorite chapter, he didn't know you were coming tonight, was uh, yours, Cheryl. Uh, he read uh, all of the chapters. Uh, there will be other resources as well, including some of the writing of, of Amy Levod uh, and also Stephen Pope from Boston College, a wonderful article that uh, he and Janine wrote. Uh, all of that will be available. Uh, also, there is a wonderful video uh, that was uh, directed uh, and made by Hunter Johnson on the work of uh, restorative justice in response to clergy abuse in this archdiocese. It's about 19 minutes. And what's the name of it again so they can, they can look it up? It's called Restorative Justice in the Catholic Church and Beyond. Restorative Justice in the Catholic Church and Beyond, and that will also be on our web page. And we'll get the web page out to everybody when it is ready. Uh, thank you to our law students, Emma, and I had mentioned uh, Ricardo, uh, Jesse, and Tyler for their presence uh, here this evening and for providing hospitality and welcome. We really thank them. Uh, there are also additional acknowledge acknowledgments in the program. Uh, and please uh, stay and continue the conversation and fellowship this evening. As we said, there are new uh, and old friends. And I have often said that I am part of an international Janine Geske fan club <laughs> that goes to Rome and, and, uh, and all over the world. I am now, because I just met Cheryl tonight, uh, decidedly a part of her fan club uh, as well, and we're happy that she's back here in Minnesota. Just finally, today is the Feast of the Nativity of Mary, uh, the Mother of God uh, in the Catholic tradition. Uh, it's Mary's birthday. 
The Blessed Mother provides us all a great model of solidarity as we journey together in a bruised and broken world. Whatever the situation, Mary was present with a prophetic word, with accompaniment, her cousin Elizabeth, with wise and practical advice at Cana, with compassion and suffering as she journeyed with her son to the cross, and with openness to the gift of the Spirit in the presence of the apostles at Pentecost. This morning, in morning prayer, I ask for Mary's intercession and maternal care as we launch this initiative that we would demonstrate the same deep solidarity for our fellow human beings who share not only a common dignity, uh, a common humanity, but a dignity given by God. So thanks again, everybody, for your presence uh, today. Enjoy the fellowship. Please keep the initiative, if you would, in your prayers. And uh, please uh, stay tuned for uh, continuing events uh, and, and also programming and information. And again, have a great night, and thanks again.